Tom Campbell here. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you and enjoy the video. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 76 Fireside Chat. We have some interesting questions today, and let's get started with TD Nordium, and TD is the organizer for the MBT Volunteer Group. So we welcome you today, TD. Please go ahead with your question. Yeah, I have uh, two questions, and uh, the first one is actually a follow-up from the Q and A that we had in March uh, with the volunteer community. Um, and uh, that was a question from Theo, if you remember, Tom. Uh, and uh, the major theme of that question was about getting rid of negativity and becoming authentic. So now we have talked this over and over, <laughs> and uh, uh, Theo would like to learn more from you about becoming authentic. So his question is, uh, what does it mean, becoming authentic, and how do you become authentic? Authentic. Okay, that's a good question. Well, let me maybe first start with the antithesis of being authentic, and that is that you live toward an image. See, that's the opposite of being authentic. You do things because you think you should do them, because people expect you to do them because it's what your culture tells you you should do. And it's not really what you feel like being or doing or doesn't really suit you, but you do it anyway because you think you should. Like, for instance, being nice to people, being polite. Um, if you are polite to people because you think you should be and your culture requires that, then that is not as good as being polite because you are polite, because you just are polite and you like people and you want to be positive and, and nice and interact with people in a way that is positive. And that's why you do it, not because you're being pressured. You know, we could talk about law. If the reason you don't commit a crime is because you're afraid of being punished, well, that's not nearly as good as you don't commit a crime because you know it's wrong. You see, there's a difference between acting kind and being kind. So it's this difference between acting and being is really the, the key to being authentic. When you're authentic, you're not acting. You're just being who you are. Okay, so we talk about change and getting rid of fear. Until you are authentic, you can't change because you don't own yourself. <laughs> you know, you're not in charge. You're just following your image of what you think you should be. It's only when you own yourself that you can change yourself. So that's why the first step of getting and getting rid of fear is becoming authentic. You know, ask those questions. Who am I? You know, what, you know, what do I stand for? What's important and what's not? Now, you may decide that you care nothing at all about being polite. Well, I'm just not polite. I'm just a grouchy person and I don't feel like being polite. I feel like just saying it the way it is. And if people like it, you know, that's good. And if they don't, that's okay, too. I just don't care what people think. Well, if you have that attitude, then that may be authentic, but it probably is also not helpful. <laughs> it's not going to help you get through life. It's not going to help you be positive. It's not going to help you communicate to other people. It's going to get in your way. So it is indeed authentic, but when you're authentic and things don't work well for you, then you change them. So you decide that being polite is like the, you know, politeness is like the lubrication 
of social interaction. It makes social interaction work more smoothly, be less prickly, be more productive. You're able to communicate more effectively if you can, you know, if you conform to your culture's uh, rules and politeness. And of course, that'll differ from culture to culture. So it just helps you interact with people. And that's a good thing because interacting with people is a very good thing. That's where most of your learning is going to come from. So <clears throat> if you say, well, I'm authentic and I just don't care about polite. Well, okay, then live that, be that and see how it works. If it doesn't work, then change it. If it works great for you, then keep it. But at least you're authentic. You are who you are. You're being who you are. Now, most people walking around today don't really know who they are. If you ask them, uh, you know, who are you really? Who are you at the authentic level? Who, wh what's the authentic you look like? Most people would say they don't know or they're not sure because the culture overlays so many requirements on us and we end up doing things because we're told to do it. Of course, when we're children, we do it because we're told be polite, you know, that's nice. And we just do that because that's part of it. But as you grow up and mature, you have to take that on as your own. You're polite because you want to be polite because it makes your relationships better. That's why you're polite. Not because somebody told you to be polite, but because it works better for you. So this thing about, you know, what does it mean to be authentic and how do you become authentic? First, you just have to do some soul searching. You just have to sit and ask these questions. Who am I really? What is my purpose? What is my point? You know, what's in, again, what's important to me and what's not? What's significant? What do I you know, how do I, uh, you know, what do I need to do while I'm here? What's my goal? It's my purpose. And you will come to realize that your purpose is to interact with other people, to learn, to grow, to make good choices, to love, to care, to be cooperative, to share. That's why you're here. Now, if that's your conclusion, then it's, well, you know, Am I good at those things? Am I good at loving and caring and sharing and interacting with people? And if the answer is, well, not really, then there's things you should change, but not change your behavior. This is not about behavior. It's about who you are at the being level. It's who you are. I could say it's who you be, but that's poor English to say that, but it's, it's being, not acting. Remember, you can act kind without being kind. One is a, the acting is, is it's really a, a, a role that you're playing. Okay. It's not really you. So if kindness seems like a good thing, and you find that you're just acting kind, but your, your heart isn't really in it, well, that's something you should change. You should think about kindness and why is it good to be kind and what does it mean to be kind and start being kind more and acting kind less, you see? So it's just that sort of thing. You start with, with thinking about who you are, what's important, what isn't, what you need to do in life, how you need to get there, and who are you? What do you feel like? And if some of that that is you is dysfunctional, well, now you need to change it and make it more functional. But you can't change it, you see, until first you accept that that is the way you are. So first you have the acceptance, and that's what I mean by being authentic. You have to realize, all right, I have this issue. I don't interact with people very well. I'm an extreme introvert, and interacting with people is very hard for me. All right. That's being honest. That's being authentic. Now, that doesn't mean that you have to learn to be an extrovert. It just means that you need to temper that introversion such that you do get good interactions with other people. 
Maybe you won't have a hundred friends. Maybe you'll only have 10, but they'll be really good friends instead of a hundred acquaintances. Well, that's just a different style and that's okay. So there's not like this one thing you need to become. There's lots of different things you can become. You can be introverted. You can be extroverted. You could be all sorts of things. Just do it out of awareness that that is what you want to do. And that's okay with you. It's not dysfunctional for you. Might be dysfunctional for somebody else, but for you, it works. Well, then be it. And do it purposefully. Be mindful of who you are and what you are and how you do things. So that's pretty much it for for authenticity. It's a it's a getting to know yourself and then being okay with who you are. And if you're not okay with it, change it. If you are okay with it, stop feeling bad about it. Stop complaining about it. Stop, you know, um, looking at the downside, but just accept it and say, that's the way I am. It's the way I want to be. It's not interfering with my life. It's not dysfunctional. And I'll just be that way. And I'll accept those the stuff that comes to me because I'm that way. You see, then you accept it and then it's okay. Then it doesn't bother you. Then you don't have buttons. Then it doesn't make you upset. Then it doesn't give you anxiety, you see, because you just accept it and you're okay with it. So I hope that answers your question, TD and, and TOs. I think so. Uh, he may, yeah. <laughs> Another question flew in while you were talking. I was thinking he may wonder how do I change it? Well, just by wanting to, by being committed to. Okay. That's how you have to have a strong commitment to, I want to be all that I can be. I want to be as functional as possible because I want to learn and grow and love and care and be a part of the solution here on this planet rather than part of the problem. And in order to do that, I have to be authentic. And wanting to be authentic, not just wanting from the intellectual viewpoint, but wanting at the being level, really caring, that's what will make you change. It's not I want to do this because I think I should. Again, it's I want to do this because I need to. It's important for me. And when you have that attitude, you'll change. That's your intent, modifying future probability, and the change will come. So you get there, you become more authentic by really wanting to, which means if it doesn't feel good, because that makes you nervous or you get anxiety, well, then you need to work through that. Not just say, oh, well, I can't do that because it gives me anxiety. Well, then you don't want to enough. If you really want to change, you'll find ways to work through that anxiety. Get beyond it, get past it, if that anxiety is dysfunctional. So it's not just accepting things the way they are. That's what I don't, I don't mean that by acceptance. I mean that you accept reality as it is and accept yourself as who you are and change what you don't like about it. Yeah, I think that this is very helpful, I think. Okay. Thank you very much, Tom. Mm. You're welcome. Okay, Eric, did you want to go ahead with your question at all? Oh, yeah, thank you. I, I would like um, So I had a question on... Uh, a different topic. It's about fear and intuitive abilities. Um, you have often explained that letting go of fear, belief and ego is key to developing our intuitive sides. And my own experience definitely confirms this. Um, even the most subtle fears and beliefs take me right out of my relaxed intuitive space and put me right back into an intellectual space instead. However, what confuses me is that I've met a number of people over the years who had exceptional intuitive abilities, but who also quite obviously had a lot of fear, ego, and emotional hangups. And the fact that this can and does happen means that there must be some way for people to sort of circumvent their fear, belief, and ego and access their intuitive space anyway. So my question is, how does that work? 
And I've heard you explain that sometimes people who've experienced uh, childhood trauma have learned to enter their intuitive space as a means to escape the difficult circumstances in which they mm -hmm. found themselves. And that does make sense. But what I don't understand is how it is possible that they can es escape that intuitive space to begin with if they're in such a fearful state of being. Wouldn't the fear block them from accessing that intuitive space at all? Uh, okay, that's a good question. No, life is more complex than it seems. You know, generally it's hard when talking about people and their growth to take one one a one size fits all a generalization such as fear and ego and belief will get in the way of being intuitive well in general that's true but there's all sorts of specifics of which those rules can be bent this way and that way people who escape a very unpleasant situation usually children who escape a very unpleasant situation, not adults, it doesn't often work very well for adults, but children who are escaping a very difficult life, they already have one foot in kind of the, the intuitive side and one foot in the material side, right? And that changes by the time they get to be 10 or 12 or 13 or teenagers, that foot that's in the that's in the the uh, intuitive side kind of disappears, goes away, and they end up with both feet in the material side. Over time, that happens. When you're an adult, you're supposed to have both feet solid on the ground, and you know by then you're a a committed materialist to to being a part of this physical world. But as a child, when you're five and six and seven and eight and ten and so on, you still have a fair connection to the intuitive side. You're still Alice living in Wonderland. You know, all sorts of things happen in your life that are sort of magic. Um, they just happen because they do, and you have no idea how they work or whatever. So you kind of live in a magical space anyway. So when you're like that, where you do have a, at least part of your being is still connected to the intuitive because you're young, that gives you this ability to then expand that piece. All right. Now that one foot you have in that intuitive world, you're going to start to work with that, develop that, hang on to that. And because you live in a very dysfunctional family, you probably have all sorts of fears and beliefs and dysfunctional things going on. But you've also developed this one little area that you can use for your escape, that you can get away from that. Now you grow up and you're an adult and you find that though your life is still full of poor choices because of your fear and because of your ego and your beliefs, you can do things like, uh, uh, you know, talk to dead people. You can uh, intuit things. You can uh, feel other people's feelings. You're good at remote viewing or you're good at you know, other things that are intuitive because you develop that space. Okay, so that happens like that. So you can be a mixture of those things. You can like develop the intuitive space and keep it along and also be completely entangled in the physical space as well, in the intellectual space as well, and keep them both there. Now, it happens less often for adults who they don't develop it while they're children, while they're still connected to the to the intuitive space, but they're able to, through practice, develop some part of their intuition. And when they do that, and in all cases it works this way, that part of their intuition is very narrow. It just allows them to do those things. They don't have an intuitive connection in general. They typically have a very very narrow intuitive connection that just does this, but not much else because they've practiced just this and not much else. It's not a general attribute of theirs to be connected to their in intuition, but it is a specific thing that they've practiced and that they do. So you can do that and you can even do that as an adult, but it takes a lot of time. It's not so natural as it is when you're, you know, 10 years old. It's, it's just, you can just drop into fantasy land and go off into the non-physical and the rest of the world drops away and you feel a lot happier. 
Whereas if you start when you're 50 or 40 and you say, oh, I want to learn how to remote view. Okay, you can go take a course, go practice it, go remote view, and you can work on it and work on it and practice and do the skills and get, get teachers. And if you do that for, oh, you know, three, four, five years, 10 years, you can get very good at remote viewing. So here you are, this very good remote viewer that you didn't learn until you were 50, but you're also still have a lot of fear, have a lot of anxiety, get angry. You know, you have you have this other dysfunction along with it. But you just do remote viewing. That's it, because you practice that and you learn that. So you have that intuitive skill, but it's a very narrow, very narrow focus into the intuitive world. And it's something that you have learned to do. And you learn to do that through lots and lots of practice and you take that other part of you, that intellectual side of you, and you just set it aside and you do this. You've kind of, it's an either or. You can't combine them both. You can't live in both spaces. You can be in this space or in that space. And you're only in it in a, in a narrow way. And the reason it's narrow is because it's only because of your practice that you can develop it. And, you know, it's hard, though some people practice and they play, you know, the piccolo, the, the piccolo, the flute, the piano, you know, and a guitar. But sometimes they do that, but that's unusual. Typically, people aren't that aggressive in their learning. Typically, they get something and that's it. They just play the guitar, period. They don't play six instruments. So people tend to develop just a very narrow process. Now, a big difference is that when you... When you get rid of your fear and your ego and develop that intuitive side, that intuitive side doesn't become an either or. It becomes part of your life. It's just part of who you are and the way you live. And your life is lived through that intuitive side and the intellectual side working together. In other words, you can make it into an integrated whole. When you have a lot of fear and belief and ego, then it doesn't usually work like that. It's an either or you go off and do this other thing, or you can come back and do this physical thing, or you can go off and do that, you know, remote viewing or, or communicating with the dead or whatever else it is, seeing auras, you can develop that skill and just jump back and forth between them. It's not really integrated to your whole life because your whole life is really, kind of incompatible. <laughs> you know, you've got parts of your life that are incompatible with other parts, but that's okay because you only do these parts then and these other parts otherwise. So that's the big difference. It doesn't, it's not really the same kind of thing. Developing your intuitive side in general, such that it becomes a part of your life, that's on the path of growing up. Developing your, your intuitive side, because you practice a whole lot, that's maybe on your path to growing up, but doesn't have to be. That could be, you know, that could be done whether you grow up much or not. So would you say then that for, uh, let's say, an adult who gets rid of their fear and their beliefs and their ego, so it becomes, so the intuitive part becomes an integrated part of their life, would you say that for them it's not necessary to learn specific abilities because it, it's already sort of part of the package yes would they still need to learn like okay i want to do remote viewing now and now i want to learn to see auras would they still need to tackle each one of those mm. things individually well if they wanted to do those things those particular things then they would have to practice them yes they would have to learn the particular skills that go with them but I doubt that this person who's gotten rid of their fear and their ego and their beliefs would feel that way. They wouldn't really care whether they remote view or not. They wouldn't care whether they could see an R or not. None of that would be important to them because they would get all the information they need whenever they needed it. In other words, it would just come to them. The things they need would come. They don't have to do a particular practice to get it. They don't have to do anything to get it. All they have to do is need it, and there it is. 
you see, and that is all life requires. That's everything that you need for growing up and for going through your life. And the fact that you're not really all that good at telling somebody what the picture relating to this number is, is irrelevant. Because in general, you're connected. If you need to know that, it would come to you. But if you want to do it on demand in very specific ways, then you need to practice. But most of the time, if you have gotten rid of your fear and ego, doing those kind of specific things are irrelevant to your life. And you get everything you need when you need it anyway, without even trying. Yeah, that makes that makes sense. I always was surprised because there there are many like obviously low entropy beings, also spiritual teachers, that do seem to have developed intuition, but they don't talk so much about things like going out of body or any other paranormal stuff. It seems mm -hmm. like it's a thing for them, even though they they are obviously intuitive people. Yes. So so that explains it. Yeah, well, there's no, there, yeah, there's no need for them to to do those particular demonstrations. You know, it's not uh, if if you're into doing demonstrations, that probably means you're having ego. Look what I can do. I can show you these marvelous things. Now, it's not necessarily connected to your ego, but those two tend to go together a bit. So mostly the people who really are evolved don't do those things. And if you ask them to, if you say, oh, okay, you're a Swami and you're real knowledgeable and you're highly evolved people, tell me what's going on in, you know, such and such a place. Well, they probably would say, no, thank you. I don't do tricks. You know, <laughs> I'm not about doing tricks. I'm not about trying to prove it to, to anybody. You know, giving people proof well, if, if you are all what you say, why can't you do this? You know, go tell me, you know, I set up a certain thing inside my house in the living room on a rug, and I want you to tell me what it is, you know, and the Swami would just kind of shake their head and ask, Look, let's go on to the next person, because that's irrelevant. You can't prove anything to people, and the proof isn't, isn't proof. It's almost impossible to prove anything, you see. People have the idea, well, if you could go on TV and levitate, then you would prove that to everyone. Oh, people see toasters flying and pigs talking on TV. That doesn't mean anything. You know, that's not proof. It's not, in other words, if, you're, if, you, need, if you need to have um, paranormal things proven to you, then you're not ready to grow up yet. It's not about paranormal. It's not about powers. It's not about being able to do any of that stuff. It's about living, you know, living the good life, being a part of the solution rather than part of the problem. And yes, those that Swami could probably learn to do that more quickly than other people because he already has all the basic stuff there to do it, but he'd still have to practice and get it down, get used to that, you know, develop his own process, develop his own tools. And he would see that as a waste of time. Why would I want to do that? You see, it just it wouldn't be important. But to do it and to do it well, yes, you'd have to practice and develop it. Because you're not used to going out and seeing what's in somebody's rug on their you know, living room floor. What you're used to doing is as issues come up in life, answers come. Right. Yeah. It's that, that's what you're used to doing. So they're different processes. And so it would take practice. So no, just because you're well developed doesn't mean that you're you're going to be good at doing tricks. And I think that people who are well developed know that people who are really anxious to see tricks done are not ready yet. They're, they're not at that part of their place where they're really ready to grow up. They're looking for proof that reality is different than it is, but they're trying to approach spirituality with their intellect. <laughs> and that's not helpful. That's not useful. So anyway, that's kind of the, the way yeah. that the way that works. Yeah, thank you. That that really clears things up. Thank you very much. Uh, so I just wanted to um, ask Tom, because you 
you seem to live a life where you like are very giving and you don't seem to have any agenda and uh, like so you seem to be very like fearless and uh, i just wanted to know how that like how does that feel like like how does it feel like to be you like how do you relate to your life and how do you deal with daily struggles and uh, yeah just like some insights of how it is like to be you as low <laughs> entry being <laughs> Well, you know, from from my viewpoint, I'm you know, I'm just like everybody else. I uh, you know when I run into things that uh, are problem, then I need to look at them, and I you know I need to say what's my what's my best choice here? How do I relate to this? And if I say, well, here's some choices, and I might be inclined to do that, but that's not really the, the low entropy solution. Yeah, well, then I need to change. So I'm at this, you know, I'm doing the same things that everybody else is doing. I'm just probably doing them in a little different place in the in the process. You know, it's like like doing math. You know, when you're eight years old, you do math. You you're learning how to you know do long division. <laughs> you're learning how to you know work with negative numbers and so on. And you're doing math and you have to work on it. And then when you're in graduate school, you know, now you're doing, you know, uh, more advanced math, but it's the same thing. You're still struggling with the concepts. You're still trying to figure out what does it mean. You're still working on things. You're just working at a little different level. So I don't know. I find my life to be fun. My life is generally, you know, 90% joy, 90% okay. Um, I don't get my ego wrapped around things and therefore things don't upset me or bother me. I see a lot of dysfunction in the world. I see a lot of dysfunction in people. I run into people who aren't very nice, just like, you know, everybody does. I have to deal with people who are trying to cheat, lie and steal, just like everybody has to deal with people like that. But that's the way it is. I see those people as just who they are. They just are who they are, doing what they're doing because that's where they are. That's the point of their own evolution that they're in. And I don't expect them to be different than that. I don't get angry at them. Uh, I sometimes take steps to not be abused by them, take steps, you know, not to be cheated by them. So I can, I can, uh, you know, I don't necessarily call that pushing back, but I can, I can be wise in how I interact and approach such people so that I'm not just an enabler of them, but at the same time, none of that gets me upset and none of that causes me anxiety and none of that is something I particularly sit around and think about at night, you know, that keeps me awake or anything else. It's just life. So life is fun. Life is full of little challenges. It's interesting. And what makes it interesting are the people in it. The nice people and the bad people, all the people in it, make it interesting and make it a fun challenge. So I don't know, you know, when you're, I am just what I am. I am, I try to stay authentic. I try to stay mindful of what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And every day is just another opportunity to grow up and to be helpful to somebody. You know, to to share, to give something back, to be part of the solution. So I don't know what to tell you about that. You know, it's uh, from my viewpoint, I don't do anything special at all. I just am. I just am the way I am, and it's easy. I don't have to do anything. I just kind of go through life being myself. What could be easier than that? And so, but so if but you do also have some. Sometimes you want things, but do you always? Is it then also authentic like, to always like communicate about what you want and need from a person? Like, do you do, you do that if you want something from somebody? Like, you do it, di you ask them directly? Well, if it's something that, that uh, you want or need or that you're struggling with, something that if you don't get, it's going to make you unhappy or it's going to cause a problem, then you should voice that. Yes, you should share that and say, I'm having this issue. But you share it not in a way of you're wrong because you're not giving me this and I'm right to need it. It's just the way the world works. And, you know, 
you know, you need to change. You know, if you come at it from that viewpoint, then all you'll do is start an argument. But if you come from a viewpoint of this is how I feel, not justifying it, not saying that this feeling is right and, and should be and is the correct way to be, but this is how I feel. That's all. That's just being honest and sharing. And if you say, this is how I feel, and, you know, if you do this or that, or if you don't do this or that, then this is how I'm going to feel. And those feelings are kind of a problem for us in our relationship. And then just leave it open for discussion with the ideas that, you know, do we want to change that? Uh, is there something needs to be changed? Do you change? Do I change? Do we just live with it? Or are we all just a little smarter because we know it exists? And now we won't just kind of blunder in places that are going to cause trouble because we don't understand. So, yes, it's always good to be honest, to be straightforward, to say what you're thinking, what you're feeling. If you have needs and, and uh, you know, you want that other person to understand your needs, well, they won't if you don't tell them, probably. So tell them. But don't tell them in the, here's how you have to change to be the way I want you. <laughs> That's not the right approach. This is just... Here I see is an issue or a problem coming up, something that we should be aware of. And then you solve the problem together, not taking any of the possible solutions. One solution is they change. Another solution is you change. Another solution is that you both change a little. You see, there's all kinds of solutions. There's probably 10 different kinds of solutions. And together, you work it out. You decide what it is. So let's say you're in that arrangement and the other person's come to you and there's some kind of issue, but you really like that person and you want to you want to keep the relationship going. But it means you're going to have to do something you really wouldn't have done otherwise. Well, if you do that with a negative idea, oh, no. OK, I'll do it. I don't like it, but I'll do it. You see, now you're negative and you're doing something that you don't want to do just because you think you should, just because it'll make the relationship better, that's not helpful. All you're going to do is build resentment in yourself until one day you're going to explode with that resentment building up. So if you decide that, okay, then maybe I need to change something, you got to change it with positive. All right, then I'm going to be that. I'm going to be that different thing. Not just do it because I have to, but do it because I want to. Because I want the relationship to be good. And I can see how it is and how that other person needs that. And even if I decide, well, the only reason that that person needs that is because they've got all this ego and they've got all this fear. And that's dysfunctional. And I shouldn't have to put up with that. That's their problem. It's their ego and their fear. They need to grow up. Well, that's arrogant. They're doing the best they can with what they've got. If they've got fear and they've got ego and that's causing them a problem, well, you may have to work with that. You may have to work with that in a very positive way to give them the safety, the space in order to grow up and change themselves. You see? So whatever you do, you do it positively. You don't do it because you have to, through gritted teeth, you know, because that'll always just blow up eventually. So it's not that you come to a, it's not that you negotiate a settlement and then everybody has to live up to the, to the rules of the negotiation. That works in business, but it doesn't work in relationships. You know, relationships, that doesn't work. It's not that you both have to put on images in order to please each other, that's going to self-destruct in time. It's that you both have to be authentic and please each other. And that may mean that you actually have to change. You may have to accommodate somebody's fear and somebody's belief and somebody's um, ego. You may have to accommodate it and accommodate it positively. Just accept it. It is what it is, and it's okay. Don't be upset by it. You see? So, again, it's a matter of always stay positive and be authentic. Do both of those things so you are authentically positive, not pretending to be positive. 
So that's, I don't know if that helps you or not, uh, Caroline, but it's a very good point that you make because this is the, this is the place where people trying to work out relationships, that's always the place they end up is in this situation. And you have to avoid arrogance. Well, it's not my problem. You're the one with the fear and the, you know, and the ego and the issue. So you need to change. I'm okay. You're a problem. You see, well, that's not necessarily good for the relationship. If you really care about that relationship, then you may say, well, I may have to, uh, I may have to just deal positively with that fear, that ego for a little while until they outgrow it. And if they don't outgrow it, well, maybe I just live with it. It'll be just the way it is. Okay, that may limit the space to which you can develop that relationship, but maybe you can still develop it in enough space that it's good enough. You see? So that's these are the fundamental issues that people run into. And it's not just boy-girl relationships or, you know, significant other relationships. It's all relationships are like that. Relationships with your children, with your boss, with your neighbors. They all basically end up in that same kind of a, of an issue. You know, how much do you demand to meet your needs and how much do you give to meet somebody else's needs? Well, demanding mostly comes out of ego and fear. Giving mostly comes out of love. It's probably a lot easier to demand than it is to give because give requires quality. Demanding doesn't require much. So it's the harder path to walk, but it's the one that in the long run creates the most happiness and the most, you know, and the best relationships. That was very helpful. I like how this turned out. <laughs> Thank you very yeah. much. Well, it's a really good question. And I think a lot of people will find that helpful because it is the central core of relationship issues. And that's, I say, the, the way we learn is through our interactions with other people. Right. So this is the stuff that we're interacting with, this stuff we're dealing with in order to in order to learn. And everybody has relationships with other people. You know, it's you don't live on an island by yourself. So this is the core understanding that you that you need. It all has to do with that being authentic and being positive and kind of accepting others as the way they are, being able to accept them that way not having to have everything the way you want it. Yeah, I just That's feel true. like if I would be authentic all like all the time, then sometimes I would seem like a little kindergarten child. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because if I would really like share what's going on in my mind, it would uh, yeah. <laughs> it's well. just like a needy little girl. And it's kind of it's also embarrassing uh, in a way. Well, yeah, well be it though. You know, be it. Go ahead and be that needy little girl. Just express yourself and be that and see where it takes you. You see, instead of letting it all be theoretical, which is, okay, in theory, uh, you'd just be a needy little kindergartner and it would be embarrassing and you go through all of that, but just do it. Be honest. Be authentic. Be who you are. And if you indeed are a tedious little kindergarten girl, then you'll see how that works. You'll see what it does. You'll see how others react to it. And then you can decide whether you need to change that or not. And not change your behavior, but change the feeling, change who you are. You see, because until you experience it and just do it, just experiment and do it and be it and see how it plays, it will probably play out very differently than the way you think it'll play out. Because the way you think it'll play out is a reflection of your own fear and ego. The way it actually plays out will be how it actually plays out. That depends on all the players, you see. So my advice in that situation is, you know, you can tell your, you know, the people in your environment, hey, <laughs> I'm going to do a little experiment and being authentic. And I'm just going to tell you exactly how I feel. All right. So be ready for this. And, uh, Don't be mean. I'm just going to be me. So do it. Do exactly what you want to do. And then look back at it after you've had enough time to see how that actually plays out. Not just for an hour, not just for first thing, but be that way for a week, for two weeks, a month. See how it plays out. Then 
look back at it and decide whether you need to make any changes or not. That's kind of the way to go through it. So see, that's what I mean. To grow up takes safety. It takes you in an environment that's safe enough for you to stretch out past what you're comfortable with, for you to do things that you might find embarrassing. That's why if you're going to help somebody else grow, you want to give them that safe space that they can be themselves in, you see, because that's the space in which they can grow. Now, you may give somebody that safe space that they can grow in, and they may not grow. They may not be ready to grow up yet. Well, okay, that's all right. When it's time, when they're ready, they will. And if they're never ready, well, that's okay, too. You'll just take them the way they are, you see. So as long as you're positive, it's all win-win. Everybody always wins. So my suggestion to you is just be that spoiled little girl and say exactly what you feel, exactly when you feel it, and see how that plays over some time. See what actually your environment does with that. Just do it and be it. And you'll learn a lot. You'll learn a lot because you'll see yourself in a way that that you, you know that is, that is more authentic and more real than you do now. It'll be a growing experience. So that's how you grow up. You get in a safe space and you just let it be, whoever you are and however you are. Just be it and see what happens. Now, if you're sa- your space is not safe and you're afraid to do that because you're immediately going to get criticized, you're going to be told how wrong you are, and you're going to be put down, now you never attempt it. So instead, you carry on an image of the way you think you should be rather than the selfish little girl that you think you are. You see, so you pretend to be something else. But that pretend just grinds away at you, grinds away at your happiness, grinds away at your positivity. And you just end up going through life with a fake smile on your face and really kind of grudging underneath that life isn't fair and you can't be the way you, you need to be. See, so that isn't a pretty ending. So be honest, be straightforward, be yourself. Find a safe space to do that in and let it all, let the chips fly wherever they do. Do it for two or three weeks a month and see just exactly where that takes you. You'll learn a lot. It'll be a great experiment, and you'll probably grow up a lot. And so will everybody around you. And then give them a chance. Say, okay, I've done it. Now, you guys, you be authentic. Let's do it one at a time. The rest of you can be the support for it. We'll do it one at a time. It's a good way to interact with people. See, we're so uptight about being ourselves and about having the right image and not saying something that's going to get criticized. We're so uptight about that that we're really afraid to take the chance to grow. So we just persist in our own little narrow belief system and our own little what set of images, and then inside we feel kind of empty and we don't feel satisfied and things aren't quite right, but you don't know how to make them right. You see what I mean? The, the, the problem just gets worse. So, yeah, find a safe place and let it all hang out and see what happens. If you're in a relationship, then take turns with that. <laughs> that's okay. I think that's a really good idea. Yeah, thank you very much. Sveta had some trouble connecting, but she has asked that I ask a question for her. She's on listen-only mode, and her question has been uh, typed into the chat box. She is asking Tom what he thinks about the current escalation of war around the Ukraine. She has a lot of loved ones there, and not politically um, a comment, but how does it look to you from the perspective of MBT if you have a chance to reflect on yet another conflict that the rest of the world doesn't know much about uh, about the psychological and historical values taken into consideration. Um, do you have a comment on that um, in general? Well, you know, there are probably many dozens of places like the Ukraine now where things are changing politically, things are changing uh, socially. 
There's a lot of unrest, unease, dissatisfaction, um, very stark lines drawn between, you know, who's part of the problem and who's part of the solution, you know, with uh, most everybody thinking they're part of the solution and that others are part of the problem. So we have that all over, and it's kind of endemic to humans in general. Humans kind of live in that space all the time, but sometimes it it grows and pulls together in a in a more in, in a more uh, I don't know widespread way to where it's not just attributes of individual humans, but it it takes on a uh, it gets organized, and when it gets organized, these clash of egos and clash of I know best and clash of you can't make me, and yes, I can, and all that sort of uh, uh, posturing. Then it gets into social, a social scale, you know, a, a, a country, a nation scale. And it plays out the very same things that people play out individually with each other all the time. Matter of fact, if you want, if you look at if you look at nations quarreling and that sort of political mess that often ends up in violence, when you look at that, it looks very, very similar to squabbles on a playground among a bunch of six-year-olds. You kind of see the parallels. You know, it looks like a bunch of people who are self-centered, who want things to be their way, and it's either... You know, there's, there's two ways of doing things, their way and the wrong way. And all sides feel that way. Well, of course, you know, it's not that all sides are equal. It's not that case. Some people are high entropy. Others are lower entropy. But it's just a struggle that we go through all the time, individually, personally, nationally, and even on the world stage, where it's not just you know, nation against nation, but block against block. You know, we we have that going on as well. And it all reminds me of kids, kids on a schoolyard. That's about the level at which it operates, except, of course, it's more serious because there's real guns and there's real, you know, there's 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 real violence and real death and destruction. Behind the bullying. Behind the demands. It's just a, a, you know, it's unfortunate, it's sad, but it, it's the growing pains of what we have to go through in the process of growing up, just like it is on the schoolyard. You mentioned a bunch of six-year-olds or eight-year-olds or ten-year-olds, and they're constantly squabbling and arguing. You know, they go out to play a game, right? Let's go out and play ball. And they spend 80% of the time arguing about the rules and 20% of the time actually playing the game. That's, that's just the way we are. And I say, look at it in terms of growing pains. You can't get to a place where everybody cares for each other. Nobody wants to overrun anybody else's free will. Nobody wants to, to dictate uh, others how to live. We're all about optimizing each other. You can't get to there unless you've gone through that schoolyard phase. So now we've been going through that schoolyard phase for probably three or four to five, 10,000 years, right? That's, that's what we've been doing. But that's a phase you have to go through first. So growing pains, it's going to happen because that's the way we are. That's the way people are. And the same thing that happens to a bunch of six or seven year olds is exactly what happens to you know, organizations and groups of people. Dynamics are the same. And until we grow up, it's just going to be that way. We'll have some people that will play the bully. Some people, that, some people will play the victim. And there will be people between those two on all, you know, all grades of that. That's a, that's a continuum, you know, and 
<sighs> Growing pains. We can't get to where we want to go unless we work all that out. And that, the, the, the destruction, the, the dysfunction that causes, the pain that that causes is supposed to be our feedback to let us know that it's not a good thing, that it's not the way that we should be. Even the winner ends up losing. It's a lose-lose. It's everybody loses. And maybe one day we will, in larger numbers, get that lesson. And when we do, those things won't happen anymore. But because there are so many of us that have not yet gotten that lesson, then things like are going on in the Ukraine where some are trying to bully others and others are trying to resist the bullying and on and on it goes. I guess I've been doing that for a hundred thousand years. Hopefully we're doing less of it now than we did, you know, a thousand years ago. I think that's true, but it's, it's nations acting like children, acting immature, acting self-centered, self-focused, and other ones trying to push back against that self-centeredness. Well, as long as there's those who will push, there's going to be a certain need to push back. You know, so that's, that'll continue until we get rid of the need to push. I don't want to leave the impression amongst the people listening here that uh, when these issues come up, when big social movements you know, happen, that one should just ignore them and say, well, I'm not involved. It's a big thing. It's all the kids playing on the schoolyard and I'll just go someplace else. That's I don't mean that, you know, you're involved in them. You live there. You're a part of it. It's your life. <clears throat> and sometimes pushing back is what you need to do. Sometimes when you get pushed, pushing back is the right thing. You know, MBT is not a pacifist philosophy. It's not a philosophy that we just kind of float up in the air, you know, above all these things and let the poor people, you know, fight with each other if they want to. But we're we're kind of floating above it. That's that's taking yourself out of the mix. It's taking yourself out of connecting. It's kind of being above it. And that leads to feelings of superiority, which are not helpful either. So. Yes, you do need to get involved. You do need to connect to things, but you don't need to connect to them through fear. You don't need to connect to, to them through, you know, what, uh, anger. If you connect to them through fear and anger, then you do become part of the problem. But it doesn't mean you just sit on your hands and do nothing, you know. You need to be a force for low entropy. You need to be a force for good. You need to be a force for caring and for love and for cooperation. And you need to do that as much as you can. And when you're pushed to something that's high entropy, then pushing back is okay. Being involved is okay. But if your involvement gets you angry, gets you upset, makes you mad, then you become part of the problem. That's you're, what not you, just, you're not just part of the solution anymore. You're part of the problem. So resist, uh -huh. yes. Push back, yes. Uh, live the right life, yes. Don't do the wrong things, yes. But stay positive. Stay positive. Always be a force <clears throat> of positiveness. Add mm -hmm. to the solution. Don't get angry. Get upset. You know, get... get uh, um, and, get, your and, ego, get your ego twisted up around it because then yeah, you become yeah. part of the problem. You can, if you stay positive, even if you're in a terrible situation, if you can stay positive, then that terrible situation doesn't drag you down and make you a part of it. Now, it doesn't work. So when I say that you don't become a part of it, I don't mean you float up above it and don't interact. What I mean is that you be positive and then it doesn't drag you down. It doesn't get your ego and your beliefs uh, 
connected to it. So it's possible, even when you live in a terrible place where terrible things are going on, that you can still be positive. You can still be happy. You oh, can, yeah, still, it, you can yes. still smile, you know, and people sometimes I hear them say, well, if this doesn't make you angry, then there's something wrong with you. Anybody with a brain, anybody who cares would be angry about this. And that's not true. Anger no. is part of the problem. You see, see. anger is part of the problem. <laughs> you have to you have to stay positive, stay happy, keep the smile on your face and still resist. Do the right thing. Push back when you need to, but not in anger. You see, not from negative space. So you can find happiness even in the midst of a terrible situation if you don't have your ego and your beliefs twisted up in the problem. Tom Campbell here. I and MBT Events hope you liked this video. We now have well over a thousand hours of free video on this user-friendly, ad-free YouTube channel. Though these videos are free to our viewers, they represent many thousands of hours in production and editing, and many thousands of dollars invested in video and audio equipment, along with the required computers and software to store and process the raw video into finished products. So far, all of this content has been funded directly out of our own pockets. Be assured, we will always continue to do what we can. It's our life, our purpose, a labor of love that we will continue to pursue as best we can. However, those pockets are not as deep as they used to be. Thus, we are now seeking to augment our resources with support from our viewers. If you find something of significant value in our videos, please consider supporting their production through our Patreon account or through a one-time donation. The links are in the description below. Thank you.